Let me show you in two seconds flat why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. I call it the success cycle, real fast. Draw yourself four squares, put them up on the screen here. You'll see, as we do this, take a quick look, you'll notice you've got the word potential up in the left-hand square. Up in the right-hand square is the word action. Bottom right is the word results. Bottom left is the word belief, or another word for that would be a sense of certainty. Potential, action, belief, results. And notice there's arrows in a clockwise fashion where they just keep feeding each other over and over and over again. So again, it's potential, action, results, belief, or another word for that would be certainty. Now, did you ever notice how rich people tend to get richer and poor people to get poorer? And I don't just mean rich in financial terms. I mean people that are rich emotionally. Did you ever notice how happy people tend to get happier? And depressed people tend to get more depressed. How many found this to be true? Say I. It's because the power of momentum and what I'm about to show you. So let me show you something here. What's the potential of any human being? You tell me, quick. Unlimited. Do most people's results reflect that true potential? Yes or no? No way. Why? Because most people aren't taking enough what? But is it possible to take a lot of action and still get lousy results? What if you've got a salesman that works for you and they walk out and they knock on a hundred doors and they say, you wouldn't want to buy anything from me, would you? <laughs> or they don't say that verbally, but they say it non-verbally. Is that going to affect their results? Yes or no? So it's not enough even to take enough action because when we believe it's not going to work or we're uncertain, does that affect how much of our potential we tap? Yes or no? Yes. See, if you don't think it's going to work, you're not going to put out a bunch of your energy when you think it's going to fail. And by the way, when you're not sure, you tap a little potential. Do you take little or a lot of action? When you're not sure, when you think it's not going to work, do you take massive action or little action? Now, when you take little potential with little action, what kind of results do you get? Little, lousy results. And when you get lousy results, what does that do to your belief? You go, see, I told you it wasn't going to work. Told you it was a waste of time. And then, by the way, when you have less belief, how much more potential do you take, more or less? If it's possible, you tap less potential, more or less action, less. And what happens to your results? They get even what? And now they got worse results, what does that do to your belief? And by the way, now you see the current economy. Isn't it true? Everybody out there is going, oh my God, the results are so bad, it's going to get worse in the future. So I better pull in my horns, there's less potential, so I'm not going to push as hard. I'm not going to take much action. Oh my God, I'm getting lousy results with little potential little action. Oh my God, it's going to get worse. That's what creates a recession, depression, whatever you want to call it. How do you change that? A lot of people, and even a lot of businesses say, well, gosh, we train our people. Who's ever done this? You train your person, they do well for a while, and then they drop off in their skill set. I don't care if it's sales, I don't care if it's a technical skill, you know, having to do with accounting or something on the computer. Who's experienced this with people you work with? Say, I. Now, you're highly motivated. You, it's your business, or you're the leader in the business, or you're the manager, or you're the head of department, or whatever. So you've got a lot of drive. So you bring emotion to the table, and you do enough repetition that you master it. They don't. If you give up on them, you don't, you're losing and missing out on what it takes to train someone. So here's how training looks. In the beginning of training, when you first start doing something, how fast do people learn and make shifts? Slow or rapid? Huge rapid change happens, right? There's this giant growth that occurs. Now, what eventually happens to anybody when they start to learn something? A new sport, a new business, a new relationship? What do they get to? What do you call it? Plateau. So think of it this way. Some people, their philosophy of life is dabbling. Here's what a dabbler does. They take on a sport like, let's say, tennis. And when they're brand new, they know nothing about tennis. They know how to hold the racket. They know how to swing. They know how to keep score. They think love is an emotion when it's a zero. Right? There's nothing, right? But from not knowing anything, in a short time, with a little bit of training, do they get pretty damn good? Yes or no? If this is 100% mastery and this is zero, they might go to 20 or 30% growth. Like that, within a few days, a few weeks. How many follow what I'm saying here? Say I. I. Now what's interesting is, will they top out? Yes or no? There'll be a point in which they plateau. What's a plateau? It's when you're doing the same amount of effort, but you're not getting the same level of reward. You're not making the same progress. So in the beginning, how hard is it to make progress when you're a brand new company? I mean, 
creating a product is progress. Selling your first customers is progress. Getting your first account is progress. Pretty easy, right? When you're in a new relationship, just learning about each other and connecting and being intimate, there's progress, right? In playing tennis, taking up a sport, there's so much progress. But in every human being's experience, there's a point where you're working just as hard, but not making so much progress, and people don't like that. That's why I told you this. And what some people do at that point, if they're a dabbler, they decide to quit. This is obviously the wrong job for me. This is obviously the wrong sport. This is obviously the wrong partner. I shouldn't be in a relationship with this person. The minute they get to a point where they're not being fed, their ego is not being fed, they're not growing, they quit. And so if this was, for example, a dabbler who was in a position of tennis, they might quit tennis and now they say, you know what, I'm not a tennis player, I'm gonna do racquetball. And they get so excited about racquetball because like, oh, this is cool, look at this, because within a few days, what happens if everybody, they start from zero and what happens? Lots of what, tell me, lots of? Progress, which feels really good really fast. They didn't know how to rock it. They, they didn't know how to turn. There were walls all around them and a ceiling. In a few days, bam, they're smashing off the back wall and the side wall. They're doing things Z's. And, I mean, it's really cool. Plus, they get a new outfit and stuff, so they look cool. They got goggles. They join a new club. There's all this progress and stuff. So guess what? Grow, 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 grow. Everything's great, 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 great. But eventually, who knows what happens? Eventually, they hit a plateau. And guess what? Rather than training themselves further for mastery, what do they do? They say it's the wrong sport. I, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't be a racquetball player. And if I was going to show you as an example, let me grab this real quick. If they've gone out and they've made all this progress, they're real happy. They go, go, go. They're growing, growing, growing. Boink, they hit this plateau. Wrong sport. Not a tennis player. Go play this, boink, racquetball, all of a sudden, working hard, not getting the result, wrong thing, wrong relationship, wrong job, wrong mission. So then they go out and play golf and they go, boom. <laughs> they don't even get the progress. <laughs> and they go, I didn't need to use the F word that many more times in my life, right? You know, different piece. Now that's what a dabbler does. And by the way, dabblers by their nature are unhappy. Think about this. Even with all the economic challenges that exist, most people in North America, for sure, have a better quality of life than 95% of the planet. 95% of the planet is living on what? How much? Two-thirds of the planet, I should say, is living on $2 a day. Your worst nightmare is somebody else's greatest dream. Most of the planet's greatest dream. Your idea of economic downfall is somebody's dream. That's the truth. And so what happens, though, is, would you agree we have more choices, more freedoms, more opportunities today than any time in human history, yes or no? Yes. Are most people's happy, is their happiness tied to the quality of life they really have? Because we're a world now that's shallow. Most people are dabblers. They try something for a while, it doesn't work out, they do something else. Now, you wouldn't be in this room for five days if you were a dabbler, but how many of you got to deal with some of these dabblers out there? Say I. Dabblers are the people you want to make sure you keep off your team or get off quickly because they're going to quit anyway. And the time, energy, and effort it takes to train a dabbler is the same energy you could have a platinum player. And we're going to show you some ways to do that later on. But let me show you another path for a second before we show you the rest of the training effect. Let's take the path of what I call a stressor. Here's the stressor's philosophy. I find the way. Who can relate to this? Say I. I'm going to find the way I'm going to achieve it. So they take up a sport like tennis, and it goes like this, and they're doing really, really well, and it's going really good, but eventually, boink, they hit a plateau. Here's the difference. Does the stressor quit? Ever quit? Yes or no? Absolutely not. What does the stressor do when it doesn't work out? What do they do? Do they settle for it? What if they actually get a little worse for a short time? What happens? They really get stressed when they go, oh, screw this, I'm going to find a way, I'm going to break through, I'm going to learn a book, I'm going to find someone, I'm going to get a coach, I'm going to make this thing happen, I'm going to find a way, I'm going to find whatever it takes to make this thing happen. Push. And they break through, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, they break through, ladies and gentlemen. Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say I. And by the way, they break through and all of a sudden they start making progress and progress and they're so happy and all of a sudden, guess what happens? Boink. And they go, damn. How the hell, well, how could that happen? I've been working my tail off. I just had this breakthrough. I just worked through this thing. I just fought through it. 
But by the way, do they hit another plateau? Yes or no? So what happens here? Do they give up? Do they quit? Do they go to the wrong sport? What does the stressor do? They stress out. Shit, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to make this thing happen. I got to make this thing happen. Come on, figure something out. Let's find this thing. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to make more calls. I'm going to make this thing happen. And all of a sudden, eventually, what happens? Poof! Ladies and gentlemen, they break through again. Come on now. And by the way, they eventually get where they want to be. The problem is, they're so stressed out by the time they get there, they're so exhausted, they can't enjoy it. Every person in this room who described failure described it for the following reasons. And I gave all the reasons. Time, money, network we don't have, people we don't have, not the right management, not the right people, right? We don't have the resource. And they went through this whole thing. I said, what all these things, not of Supreme Court justices, what they all have in common is, you're all saying we didn't have the resources to succeed. Money is a resource. Time is a resource. Technology is a resource. People is a resource. Experience is a resource. Supreme Court justices are so many resources. Right? And they all agreed. I said, here's the only problem. I said, in my experience, and you correct me if you're wrong, and I want an honest answer. When we get out of ourselves and we look at human beings and their ability to succeed or fail, how many people you've ever met who did not have the resources and they beat somebody who had all the resources? I said, resources, when you look at the most powerful and effective people in history, were never the problem. They didn't have the resources, but they got them. How do people get resources when they don't have them? The answer is, they're resourceful. <laughs> the ultimate resource is resourcefulness. That's what makes someone successful. And here's what's great about resourcefulness. Who has it within them? Who? Who? Every human being. But the question is whether you access it or not. Now, strategic innovation is different than just constant, never-ending improvement. Can I? Constant, never-ending improvement is a very, very important principle. If you're not constantly improving, you're definitely going to be passed up by your competition. But if you're thinking about strategic innovation, what it really means to me is re rewriting the rules for competition within an industry, within an area. When you change how people compete, when you change the rules, you take over that industry. You shift completely the game. So in my industry, the vast majority of people spoke and still do for one to three hours, which many of you yesterday wish I was one of those people. <laughs> but that's usually it because what it was is about inspiration. Right? It's inspire people. And what happened for me is 90% of them are an hour and 90 minutes. And I was like, it's wonderful. That's a useful tool. But, you know, inspiration is like motivation. Motivation is nice. I and mean, it's like a bath. You know, you, it doesn't last, but you still take a bath every day. But my view was, how do I get people into immersion? How do I put people in experience where their life really changes? And so I changed the game. And people never even considered saying, we're going to do three or four days and nights where you're going to go 50 hours. No one will sit there. They won't sit for a three-hour movie that someone spent $200 million on. But I changed the game. I changed the rules because once people got the result, even if in the beginning it was tough on them, by the end, the level of transformation was so huge, it changed the rules, it changed the game, it changed the size, it gave me a brand, it let me dominate an industry because when people walk up to me throughout my life, the number one phrase, you can see me anywhere in the world, a dozen times a day, not in a seminar, I mean, just walking around is, oh my God, Tony Robbins, you changed my life. It's like, I always say, you changed, but thanks for the credit. I'm glad I helped. But they'll say that like clockwork every single time. That's different than I like your product. That's different than I enjoyed your seminar. You changed my life. That changes the rules for competition. That created a different way of competing. Now, I didn't do it to compete. I did it because my passion was I love people, and I don't want them just to be inspired for the moment. I want to make sure they really have the tools, the skills, the ability, the shift that creates a lasting change in their life, and I wouldn't settle for anything less. So you don't have to do it to compete. You strategically innovate because you're obsessed with meeting the needs of your clients. Is it the single most important skill in life? We hate the word selling, so I'll give you a word that it really is that doesn't have the negative connotation. It's the word that all leaders have. What would that word be? Influence. What changes companies is leaders. The only way to change a company is leadership. If I want to change a company that I own and I want to make a shift in that company, the number one thing I'm going to do is shifting leadership. 
That might be taking leaders to a different level. That might bring new leaders in. That might be new leaders of new voices with new perspectives, with new skill sets, new directions. But we need to take things to another level. Leaders solve problems and leaders maximize resources. If you're going to solve problems, you can't do it yourself. It would have already been solved. You have to get others to help you to do it. That requires influence. True? If you're going to get people to maximize resources, that requires influence. If you're going to get people to partner with you, provide you resources, capital, suppliers, anything, that requires influence. If you're going to have an impact on your kids or your community or the world, that requires influence. There is no more important skill of leadership than influence. And yet most of us think of it like selling, and as a result, we don't master influence. So I'm not here today to try and get you to become a master of influence in 45 minutes or so of my chatting with you here because we have so many of the speakers. This is the area of life I am most focused on. Because I know that if you can't influence, you can't lead. But if you can influence powerfully, intelligently, with integrity, there's no limit to whatever you can envision and what you can make real. And if your influence becomes not just you as the influence, but you're able to influence systems, people, company, culture, if you can turn other people into influencers, now whatever you vision about can be made into reality. And so as a skill of influence, we gotta ask ourselves, how many agree leaders are what change companies? Raise your hand if you agree with that, say aye. aye. And leaders' number one skill is influence, if you agree, say aye. aye. But then the question becomes, how do you influence? If I can be part of what helps you, but you do the major work, or you make the final thing, you're gonna own it more. So what I would do with people is I'd say, simple, here's your problem. I want you to write down what the problem is and describe it in two sentences max. This is your memo. Two sentences, crystal clear that anybody will understand it. If, if, I have, if you have to write more than two sentences, you have to tell them a paragraph, the question doesn't work. It has to be a maximum of two sentences, ideally one, so crystal clear anybody can understand it. That's number one. So you write that down. You write down, define the problem with precision. Describe the problem or the request. And sometimes it's not a problem, sometimes it's a request. Can we turn the air conditioning up? Can we turn it down? Can we have lunch at whatever time? Can we do this? Can we do that? Whatever the request may be. So you write it down. Then the second thing I have them do is describe three solutions to their request or problems. Three, and I use keywords, three cost-effective, intelligent, viable solutions. Might be viable, time viable, resource viable, whatever the case may be, viability. So what are three intelligent, practical, viable solutions that we could, you believe we can implement, that you believe we can implement to solve this or to meet this need? By the way, why do I come up with, have them come up with three? Someone tell me why. One choice is no choice. Two choices is a dilemma. Until you have three choices, you're not at choice. That's my rule in life. You may not like all the choices. But whenever you think you have one choice, one choice is no choice. If you've got two, you're in a dilemma. There's always at least three choices. Plus, I'm making that person become a problem solver. If I solve the problem, they'll just have a new problem for me to solve. But if I can teach them to be a problem solver, the game changes. How many follow? Now, sometimes this is less efficient, but with a mass audience, it was very efficient. And then they turn that in, and then I then have a choice. I can now respond back by saying, circle, I accept your request, or I think solve the problem, we'll do it with your number one. Or I could modify it, I'm willing to do that, but I think we need to do this and this is the way to do it. Or I could reject it and tell them why. And then we'd have this communication. It was very efficient. This is very different than, you know, tell me what you think we should do in a suggestion box. So now, tell 